in a very nice light way to end the evening. Um, this young gentleman, <laughs> off to a good start, he's a, a, a conservationist, farmer, tourism operator on the banks of the Whanganui River, also a competitive axeman, hunter, historian, lodge host, rugby fan, husband, father, who never dreamed he'd turn into a bird geek. Well, he fell in love with a bird when he was 21. Uh, that unwittingly shaped the rest of his life, and it wasn't his current wife. It was Blue Ducks, the FIO. Now, after stints at Massey University, he headed, as most Kiwi blokes do, to the UK, but longing to come home to the bush uh, of the gorgeous Wanganui region. Dan Steele returned to buy the neighbouring property uh, to his parents, a 1,400 hectare station that he turned around and named after his favourite bird, Blue Duck Station, which also has 800 hectares of land that's been left to regenerate, 450 predator traps in full swing, six kilometres of fencing being built along streams and rivers because this was taken from a very old uh, Life and Leisure article, I'm sure. Dan will be able to update us on more and more of the incredible improvements uh, that he has. A welcome to the stage, Dan Steele of Blue Duck Station. Thank you, Sarah. You called me young and light. Uh, you've been generous on both fronts. Um, Southland, hello. Nice to be down here. Good to see all your smiling faces. Uh, yeah, i have uh, just here to tell our story and hopefully you get a little bit out of it and we'll have a couple of laughs. But uh, Sandra got in touch and said she was organising an event all the way down here. Uh, and uh, so the wife decided we would uh, double us up, get take the kids out of school, get a camper van and do a long overdue family holiday around the South Island. Uh, we've got four kids and... Uh, Four kids in a camper van, we've just done two weeks. <laughs> Who would have thought that was a good idea? I got uh, twin three-year-old boys, they're just fresh three, a couple of weeks ago. And they are relentless. <laughs> in every which way. One of them's got FOMO, he just constantly just does not want to go to sleep and can't wait to wake, can't wait to wake up in the morning. And uh, he is a pleasure to be around, man, but you've got to have some energy to keep up with him. And having him in a little tin box travelling around the country, you just um, yeah, you just got to expect the unexpected. You know, you're uh, driving along the highway at 100 kilometres an hour in a camper van, and he'll pop up over the seat and climb on over. G'day, Dad. You know, um, yeah, he's just yeah, good fun. But I haven't done done a camper van trip like this. I've got three boys. So I've got um, yeah, it's my my wife Sandy and uh, my my children Blue Riley Steele, who's 10. Snow Morgan Steele, my little princess, who's uh, six. Uh, Forest Falcon Steele, who has uh, just turned three, and he's seven minutes older than Blue Riley Steele, who's the, um, oh, sorry, no, sorry, uh, uh, River Storm Steele. I've got so many kids, I forget their names. <laughs> um, but, uh, yeah, River Storm Steele, who was very aptly named, the little, uh, little, the little cyclone. But um, yeah, I haven't uh, done a road trip like that really with that many boys in the van since I travelled around Europe in 97. Uh, and there was nine Kiwi boys travelling through Europe on the OE and uh, we weren't particularly well behaved. I mean, New Zealand's a pretty small country. I was probably in there with uh, maybe some of your sons, yeah, or the, maybe the odd uh, husband could have been travelling with, maybe even the odd grandson. No, um, but... Um, yeah, nine Kiwi boys travelling around Europe, and, and uh, what a trip that was. But um, now I'm travelling with my own team of boys, and it's been fantastic. It's been great coming down uh, Christchurch and over to the West Coast, and, and uh, we went to Hokitika and, and jumped in a helicopter with a mate of mine who's, um, who's, who's uh, set up business there, and he's, he's um, got precision helicopters, and he, he oil and gas exploration closed up in Taranaki, so he left a couple of boys in Taranaki with a chopper and moved another chopper down to Hokitika and he set up a tourism thing there about a year and a half ago. Great timing. Uh, set up a tourism thing right beside the Hokitika Gorge, flying tourists up and around having a look at the Southern Alps there. But we, we called in and saw Matt and he took us for a fly and just what an unbelievable experience flying around the Southern Alps. He said he's got 
uh, 300 huts in the Southern Alps within 30 minutes flight from his base. And we saw some huts that I've got some new life goals, you know, like I said to one, flew over one, I think it's Emerald Lake and it's on this amazing just location beside a lake up in the Southern Alps and, a, and on a, just situated on a massive bluff, you know, there's just rock everywhere and there's a hut just situated there and we're flying around. I said to the wife, I said, we are going to go and stay there, you know, like what an amazing experience and um, you're yeah, very, very cool. So if you're going up to Hokitika, go and see my mate Matt. And I said, how are you getting on now? And he said, well, you know, tourism's sort of died. I'm, that's why I came down here, because oil and gas is no good anymore up in the north, so it's because of Cindy. Um, just Cindy, that is, sorry. Um, you know, I thought I'd get into tourism, and now COVID's hit, but he's actually going all right. He's, uh, he's, um, he's getting on with the, all the locals on the west coast, and, and uh, he's doing a bit of dock work and a bit of agricultural work and a bit of all sorts. He's a very good chopper pilot. And um, I said, so it's all right setting up business? He said, yeah, it's not too bad. Down here, Dan, you just have to be a bit of a uh, left-leaning, right-wing, redneck greeny. <laughs> he said, as long as you're a bit like that, you'll get on okay. And uh, he's just a coaster. I don't reckon we'll ever get him off the coast. It's great. But we came on down. Next great experience, I suppose, I had. We missed our campsite, um, Makarora, where we were meant to stay. And, and the missus wasn't navigating too good and the kids were misbehaving and I kept on driving and it got dark and we went, oh, where are we? So we pulled in somewhere beside Lake Harwear and drove up a track and ended up at this um, little dock campsite in the bush and we were the only ones there, so turned the camper off and off, I all go to sleep. I got up in the morning, all the kids were asleep, everyone, so I snuck out and went for a walk around the lake, went to see if there's any deer sign and have a wander around. And I was up on the farm and then I heard this roaring coming along the road, I thought, that's not a Hilux. Then a Land Rover comes roaring around the corner, so I just stood on the road, the Land Rover slowed right down and uh, wound the window down and he saw my jacket and he goes, well, you're not from Blue Duck Station in North Island, are you? I said, yeah, you know, I am, yeah, g'day. He goes, oh, g'day, mate, I'm just, uh, this is, you know, I'm, I'm Digby and uh, this is, uh, you know, Hunter Valley Station and we're chatting for a minute. He goes, you want to come for a ride, shift some sheep? I said, my fur coat I do. So we're off driving around and next minute we're up at his homestead taking the whole family up there and he's getting, his missus is getting lunch on and, and uh, it was just one of those things, you know, you just, it was um, Kids Bush on the edge of Lake Harwear where we were staying and uh, two hours later we're up in the homestead having, or well, four hours, wherever it is, having lunch and talking and, and uh, we've got new friends, you know. So they're organising to come up to Blue Duck Station and stay and we're organising to come back down to uh, Hunter Valley Station and have another holiday with them, with them and do some jet boating and horse trekking. And it's just one of those road trips. It's been, it's been fantastic. So, um, look, uh, yeah, that's my little corner of the world I'm going to tell you a little bit about. Uh, and uh, we've got some pretty cool scenery up north too, eh? It's not just in the South Island. Uh, but uh, that's where I'm located on the, in, the, in the Whanganui National Park. And you can see the central... Mountains up there of the Mount Ruapehu, the highest peak in the in the uh, North Island, and you're looking there at the Tongariro Crossing and and uh, and all the central mountains there. And so that's just a photo I took um, from from one of our ridges across our rugged landscape. And uh, we'll show you a short little video now of, of just uh, a little bit of our operation.
That'll do. Beauty. So uh, that's sort of a little bit just, a uh, picture says a thousand words, so a video must be made way more than that, eh? That's our little uh, corner, of the, corner of the world there, Blue Duck Station. Uh, it's just an area really steeped in history and, uh, and, a, and a pretty special spiritual place for New Zealand. And uh, plenty, of, plenty of Māori history, the Wanganui River was used as the main access way up into the central North Island when the Māori people would take their walker up and down and great for trading and, and gardening and, and, uh, and getting up there as hunting parties and bits and pieces. A lot of Māori population up through the central North Island used the Wanganui River up and down. And, and uh, so it's, got a, it's a pretty spiritual place for the Māori people. And then um, Europeans come in and, and uh, the man called Alexander Hattrick started a trade with riverboats up and down as, as the first European farmers were starting to farm up and down the Wanganui River and a massive tourism operation on the Wanganui River. And uh, this boat behind us there was a, a, a floating houseboat, five-star floating hotel that he built and it actually was moored and ended its life at our place. Uh, but it was 20 guest rooms and, and a on the, um, one story and on the other story had a restaurant and a, a smoking room and a ladies room whatever that is and and back in the day and everyone would get dressed up and go to this five star hoting, floating hotel but so up and down the Wanganui River there was a there was a lot of action and then uh, they started farming all these valleys and the most famous famous monument of uh, of my place and and on farming some of the farmland that was given to World War One returned soldiers. The, the settlement farms, and the most famous monument of that is the this place here called the Bridge to Nowhere. And uh, have any of you, how many people here have been to the Bridge to Nowhere? Hands up, oh yeah, looks like about 10 here, 12 here or something, yeah, yeah okay. So it's a pretty uh, sort of iconic backcountry place and, and I'm, I'm farming some of those farms, which is pretty cool, pretty um, pretty honor, honorable thing and, and uh, but the settlers would be turning on their, in their graves largely because they would spent all their lives cutting it out of bush and I'm flat out trying to grow it back into bush. I like a bit of bush. But, um, oh, it's good, you know. It's what New Zealand needs, isn't it? It's what New Zealand needs. So the Bridge to Nowhere, great story about the Bridge to Nowhere, though. And look, these early settlers went in there. Basically, it was too remote, too hard. 45 big farms for, a, for, for fighting wars for your country, but... Um, the government uh, ran out of money and, and uh, all the farmers were sort of ordered out of there and, and most of it all reverted back to Crown ownership. And there's just a little bit of my place and one other small spot in there that's still in private ownership. But um, what do we got here? I'm just, uh, you know, I'm a man who who's, uh, owns his own rainforest, which is pretty cool. And I loved it before I even saw it. My parents uh, told me they were going to buy a farm down there. Driving out there, I said, we're going to buy it. They said, well, you haven't even seen it yet. I said, yeah, but we've got to buy it. So I talked my parents into buying um, the property out there, and then I travelled the world in bits and pieces, came home, just burning ambition to get back there, set up tourism, eco-tourism, and all sorts of things. Realised pretty quickly that I couldn't actually farm in partnership with my father. Typical male, you know, um, a little bit, father-son relationship or with some of them, but I, you know, I couldn't work with them day on, day out. So... I came up with a plan and bought the neighbouring property and set up Blue Duck Station and my parents are still my neighbours. Although now I lease their property as well and run the whole thing as one. So it's pretty cool. And uh, but then up in the local town, I was out there and, and setting up a business and, and uh, getting amongst it and back from overseas, living the dream. Uh, but of course I needed someone to live it with. I went to the local tourism meeting and uh, I met this young lady who had, uh, at the same time to me, and been there for a few years, had bought the no local nursing home at the local town in Ratahi and turned it into a 60-bed lodge. And uh, I thought, all the things she's done in the world, I thought she was well in her 30s and told her so, and she told me I was a cheeky hooer. She was only 28, and um, she's now my wife. <laughs> and that's her, um, that's her business. So she bought the local nurses home. So we, she tells everyone after she tells them that we met on... Uh, NewZealandDating.com, which we didn't. We met at a local tourism meeting, but never let the truth get in the way of a good story. She, um, we, she tells everyone we've got his and hers lodges, and that's what we do, partially. So we met, uh, and then invited a whole lot of people out. This is all the boys arriving to the wedding. Her idea, we had to have a country and western themed wedding. So that's me and the groomsmen arriving to the wedding, um, which was at our own cafe down on the banks of the Wanganui River. And uh, 
there we go. Got all tied up and four kids later and here we are in Southland talking to you. <laughs> there we are now in our stable. So that was taken uh, two days before we come off down south here. So that's how big the kids are now. Yeah, fun and games, eh? Fun and games. But um, so what we've done here, yeah, we've, um, we've set up tourism on our property. We've, we've bought the 1,400 hectares and the place in Rārahi, the wife did that all independently, it's still his and hers lodges, we run them completely separately. But we have tourism business, and we have built six lodges on the place, and uh, we do activities, take people horse riding, jet boating that you saw a bit of, kayaking, guided hunting, everything you can do to experience the great outdoors, I suppose. We're trying to showcase the wild New Zealand, and we're pretty lucky with a beautiful rainforest, so we try and showcase it teach people how important it is and hopefully they get inspired to look after New Zealand, you know, and, and uh, that's what we're doing. We're still farming. We're running about 10,000 odd stock units, sheep, beef and a small deer farm. Uh, but we only do that, you know, it's a lifestyle thing because um, that doesn't make any money. It's just, um, just you know, keeping the shepherds paid really. But uh, the <clears throat> what's been good for us in the last few years is honey. We're very fortunate we've got, a, uh, with all the abandoned farms of the World War One. They're all reverting into bush now and they're covered in manuka. And so we've got a big manuka honey operation. And uh, last year we had our record year, we produced 49,000 kilos of high grade manuka honey off the station, which was just brilliant. You know, tourism and farming, in our class of country, we're hard country, you know, like we had a storm three years ago that cost us $500,000. Well, there's your profit gone from farming for a few years, right? And uh, you learn about the right insurance just after you need it, like business disruption insurance and track and culvert insurance and all that sort of stuff that I didn't have, paying 20 grand a year thanks FMG, but I didn't have the right insurance, so I got you know zero dollars out of uh, out of that storm. Now FMG have been great to me, by the way. They've been a great company. I seem to um, get in trouble a lot, and FMG have been fantastic. But I had none of the right insurance when I needed it. Big storm, 500 grand. See you later. But, um, but honey was good, so that pulled me out of a hole and away you go. So we're pretty diverse, you know? And that's, I think, we've got to be, and that's part of my story is about diversification and why New Zealand should be so diversified. We don't want to rely on one thing. You know, um, as we've just seen, tourism was screaming along and tourism was gonna be everything for New Zealand, wasn't it? Who saw that coming? You know? I don't know if one of economists or you know anyone who predict well some of the experts did predict it mind you they said there will be a pandemic it's just a matter of when but no we're very fortunate we got a rainforest in, in, in New Zealand which was you know is the last loneliest loveliest place on earth and and, and that's us uh, yeah so that's our tourism horse trekking and taking people out in the rainforest and and um, getting up above the mist and the clouds and, and having fun and uh, what else we got there Oh yeah, jet boating. The Wanganui River is a very, very special place, and we take people to the bridge to nowhere and and, um, and do a bit of that. And this is a very, very cool photo. And this is sort of where we get into a bit of uh, what Sarah was talking about: change, you know. And change is constant. Change is good. This is the old people. I live in the homestead of this old couple here, Mr. O. B. Dobbs there with his walking stick and Mrs. O. B. Dobbs. Now this is a fantastic photo. There's a fair bit to it. This photo was taken at their 65th wedding anniversary at our local sports day, wood chopping and horse sports, with all 18 of their children present. It's got to be some sort of record. Me and the wife now live in their original homestead. Still a little three bedroom box homestead. We've only got four kids and the missus is going on about how we need to expand it. I say, hang on, hang on, hang on. <laughs> you got to get busy, girl. <laughs> Ethel Dobbs there, 18 kids, all singles, no cheating, she used to say. <laughs> all singles, no cheating. But, you know, I'm real fortunate that I bought some of the farms off two of those kids. And um, Hilary Dobbs is right down the bottom. She's on the bottom right. She's third from the right. She was a lovely lady. She lived till 91 died about nine years ago, and her older brother Mally, he's on the top, second in from the left, he's a little midget with big ears, he died at 94, 10 years ago, and I was good friends with both of them, and um, you know, but 
they needed their, their properties needed to change. They were old New Zealand. They'd cut down too much bush. They drained every single wetland they could. They cut down every native tree that had a bit of value. It was their thinking, you know, that's just what they did, trying to break in land and feed Mother England. But really, really interesting, you know, they did develop too much, but they had a great old life out there. And 18 kids, as far as I know, and I still know a lot of the grandkids and things, all 18 of them turned out good back then. Community was all it was, you know, they were too far from town to do much, but they had their own community. And think about that now, 18 kids, how many of them are going to turn out good in today's society? You know, you know, it, you know statistically, you only have 0.5 of them ending up on a farm, if that. You know, only 3% of New Zealand are farmers or farming families. You know, you probably have two of them living in Aussie. One of them will be sent back as a 501 with a meth problem. <laughs> you know, but back then, all 18 children turned out good. And um, that is something, isn't it? So, say something about rural communities back then. And things are changing so fast now, and not all for the good. But, um, you know, they needed the community. They were so remote. And, uh, and, you know, I talked to Hillary a lot, and she used to tell me a story about her annual trip to town. Annual trip to town. Tomara Nui, the big smoke. <laughs> and uh, if wool had gone all right and everyone had worked hard and the kids had cut down enough bush with their axes, they used to get one shilling spending money. They would take the horse and cart for the little kids and, and the big kids would ride horses from our place 40 kilometres up the road to Rorimu, where this famous spiral is and all that sort of carry on. Then they'd get on the train, shooting the Tomara Nui, and Hillary would, she said, the excitement leading up to town day, she just, the night before, she said, forget about sleeping. Get into town, get off the train, just couldn't walk, wait to walk up and down the main street of Tomara Nui which is like walking up and down the main street of Westport, you know, it's hugely exciting. <laughs> and, uh, but she said she just couldn't wait to see what the ladies were wearing. And then she'd go to the, uh, pat the dress shop, choose a pattern, choose some material, spend her shilling, get it all wrapped up in brown paper, um, stay in the hotel and they'd go home to the farm the next day. But she said the next week was still exciting because she got to make her dress. And, and then she got to wear it out, you know. And, you know, these people were still living on the farms when I was, you know, there and fortunate enough to get to know them and get their stories, and it was just absolutely brilliant. But, you know, they were living subsistence, you know. They couldn't... Their children took over from them, but then it's all died out. They were still recycling fence staples to rebuild the next fence, you know. Uh, my neighbour up there, he used to employ docking teams. He'd never get the same one back because he'd employ these guys, he was making them shear the wool off lamb's tails with hand shears before they cut the tail off. This is how subsistence farming these guys were. They saw no big picture, you know. They were draining everything, trying to farm every little acre. And our place is hard land. You saw in some of those photos, you know, it, doesn't, it's, it belongs in bush, a lot of it. And they were just pushing it too hard. So change was needed. And uh, so I've come in and I've chosen Blue Duck Station as the name and the mantra of the property because Blue Ducks are such a great indicator species of the healthy environment. You want to talk about water quality, you want to talk about habitat improvement, you want to talk about what makes New Zealand great. Blue Ducks are the epiphany of all of that, you know, and they need everything to be right. They're a much better indicator species for the health of New Zealand than the Kiwi is. So that's why I've called it Blue Duck Station and it represents us down on the farm where we are and what we want to do and our values and they represent New Zealand as well. So, um, you know, collectively, it's no one's fault, but we've stuffed New Zealand pretty bloody rapidly. And uh, we've got to realise that as rural people, as a minority, we've got to own that, own our share of it, and demonstrate that we're going to change that. You know, you know so we've got to trap and, and retire and regrow and fix this problem and try and get more biodiversity on farms, more native back on farms. And, you know, this, we have to do it. If we want to have high-value products out of this country, there's just no question. You know, decarbonising and all that, brilliant. But we've got to look after biodiversity first, you know. That is the big, big elephant in the room. The big elephant. Biodiversity. The wild places that make us famous, you know. So, look, interestingly for us, you know, we're now making more money out of the land we're reverting with manuka honey and, and the money, and we've got that in the ETS and, and um, sequestering carbon from that manuka scrub and things as well. And so we're making more money from that, net money, more net money. We don't always turn over more money, but 
you make more net money from that reverted land than you do out of your best farmland, which is interesting for me. You know, but still New Zealand farming's in two camps. Those that think, yeah, let's bring the you know biodiversity back, let's do this conservation thing, let's go hard, let's retire some of our worst country and 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 uh, get into it. And then there's a whole lot of people who just don't want to do it. No, every meter of our land should be in production. And how dare those bastards in those offices tell us anything else? And I do agree. There's a lot of bastards in offices, and uh, they are um, self-filling and and creating themselves jobs, and that's a big story too. But when it comes to nature and our homes, which is rural New Zealand, we got to look after it. And it's up to us to lead. It's up to you to lead. You know, New Zealand's got something about women leaders now, haven't they? I've heard something, you know, like someone, you know, first to vote in the world or something. I think we've got a New Zealand Prime Minister. There's a woman now. She might be quite a recognised leader. Um, but, you know, lead or be led. And rural people, we got to lead this. Otherwise, we will be led. And you're not liking being led at the moment, are you? No one likes being dictated to by people who sit in traffic for two hours in Auckland every day and then telling you you're doing a bad job. So lead. <laughs> Interestingly, now, trials, tribulations, problems and opportunities for New Zealand. A couple of minutes on this. Look, we've never had it so good in so many ways. You know, we're pretty good money from our produce. We've got low interest rates. We're the lowest sort of subsidy uh, farming operation in the world now in New Zealand. We got it good in so many ways, but it's bloody tough out there still, isn't it? I talk to a lot of farmers in my business. I talk to a lot of all sorts of people, which is interesting for me. And people are still hurting. And people are, um, you know, there's fear out there. There's, uh, um, you know, there's so many problems in agriculture and so much sort of regulation coming into our businesses where we're not feeling appreciated. We're 3% of the population with only 14% of people in New Zealand living rural. We're an urban population on the bottom of the planet and we're not appreciated for what we do. You know, but this is a pro product, I believe, of, of a largely broken model in agriculture where it's evolved through finance and, and um, overproduction for, for other people's benefit, not necessarily the farmer themselves. You know? uh, increased land values, you know, uh, so much that farming or passing the farms on to your children is too tough, and so other people are moving in, like pine trees up in our area, taking over sheep and beef stations, because they can make a fortune out of farming carbon. And that's corporates doing it. It's not farmers doing it very much at all. There's um, old farmers are, you know, the average age is 57 years old now, so if you're younger than that, well, you're, you're going all right. Um, you know, but it, we're asset rich and we're cash poor, so we've got to change these things, and if we don't, our communities and our lifestyles are, are um, becoming, you know, less and less pleasant, and that's not a good place to be, and I want us to be real pleasant, because I tell you, rural New Zealand, New Zealand's the best place in the world, rural New Zealand is the best place in the world, it's the best place to bring up children. Who could imagine having children, four kids like me, living in Auckland? What the hell would you do? An hour each way to sport, two hours each way to school, you die of carbon dioxide poisoning, just uh, getting where you've got to go. So, I mean, we live in the best place in the world, we've got to look after it. But there is, you know, too much government coming into our lives, uh, down on the farm, so this is where we've got to lead, you know, and politicians, they're, you know, they are a little bit like nappies, as you well know, probably um, what nappies are like, they need changing often, and politicians need changing often, and sort of for the same reason, really, they become full of, yeah, and interestingly, health and safety is one of my bugbears, now, Health and safety is good, but we should get back to common sense a little bit. Actually, on our farm, this is the site of the first... This happened on our place, actually, but we'd have known it then. This is the first site of the first OSH uh, case of New Zealand, where the beekeeper went through the um, army-built bridge that was owned by my neighbours. And it's a famous, famous case, if you study law, or some of you will remember it. You know, a lot of farmers changed the way they farm after this happened. Beekeeper driving across the bridge, and you can see in the picture on the left there, the big hole in the bridge from left to right, one third of the way across. The beekeeper, his ute full of honey, fell 100 feet to his immediate death. 17 feet underwater we, uh, when the police divers came in that afternoon and dived down and pulled him out of his ute, stone cold dead. First Osh case of New Zealand. 
Uh, and so I talk to a lot of people about, they come to see this bridge and they come to see why they changed their farms and what happened. And they feel sorry for the old farming couple that had the bridge. But actually that was a bit of a fallacy because the old farming couple knew the bridge was rotten and they would never use it themselves. And so we actually had to correct people's um, thinking about that a lot. But interestingly, the first OSH case in New Zealand happened on our place. But, you know, uh, how are we going for time? Oh, too much time. So, um, yeah, so I get to talk to a lot of people about this. And health and safety uh, has become a huge issue on farms to the point where farmers are scared to do a lot of things. And, and I think that's a big concern. So I talked to so many people, I decided I'd better go off and get a bit more educated. So I shot overseas and did a Nuffield scholarship to work out what the best plan for New Zealand should be. And I'm pretty fortunate I've done that in 2015. And around environmental planning and, and what what's New Zealand's um, place in the, in the world village should be really. The big thing's really, overpopulation's huge, but there's no shortage of food in the world. No shortage of food at all. And that's something that New Zealand's got to change its mindset on, you know. Um, we've got to be a high value uh, in, in, a, in, a, in a high sort of uh, uh, demand product in everything we do from New Zealand, but don't be producing a commodity that's just going to be in competition with everything else. So we've got to um, be very careful we don't over farm New Zealand. And we don't want to over tourist New Zealand either, you know, like we were doing. Just been in Milford and talking to the guides, they said, this is brilliant. We're doing two boats a day. We're loving Milford again. Uh, the dolphins have come back. We see dolphins, you know, twice a week now. They're only seeing them every two months in the bay in the peak of tourism two years ago. They said there was 18 boats a day doing four trips a day. So much noise in the water that the dolphins disappeared out of Milford Sound. We don't want to over-tourist New Zealand. I loved Milford the other day. Two years ago, with the lines of buses that I saw the car parks for that were all empty, I loved walking through those empty car parks, but 18 boats doing four trips a day and 50 buses stacked up, I would have hated Milford. So, you know, we can't over-tourist it. We don't, want to, we don't want to over-farm it. We want to diversify it as much as we can. So that's New Zealand's opportunity to me. Back to the family. Uh, it's, you know, we've got to be a unique, beautiful, diverse, high-value place. We've got to protect our wild places with every drop of our blood. Rural New Zealand... You know, and we've got to have, uh, we've got to show how much we care about it. People that care out there, caretakers of the land. We need uh, a huge vision for New Zealand, and agriculture's got to be a big part of it. And Jacinda's got some good ideas uh, around some of that, but I think she needs agricultural's voice in there a whole lot more. You know, COVID's hit the world. We are in such massive demand now. You watch how this plays out when people can get here, invest in New Zealand, live in New Zealand. There's some huge demand coming our way. We are the envy of the world, and how are we going to play it? New Zealand's environment, its biodiversity, and its you know its biodiversity and its landscape are the backbone of New Zealand. It's not agriculture as the backbone. We've got to change our thinking on that. You know, ag, tourism, horticulture, tech, everything. We are the benefactors of our environment and our location. We are the benefactors. We're not the backbone. Don't go telling. You know, as a farmer, don't go spouting on, we're the backbone of the country. You just piss people off. Because everyone goes, well, hang on, you're not the only thing in New Zealand. You know, we are the benefactors of the backbone, which is our environment. And if we can get our thinking around that, we'll be better off. You just chuck that second half of the video on there, and we've got a... This is where we're taking tourism to the next level on our property.
So that's our new uh, venture taking tourism to the next level. Fine dining on the back of the station, out amongst those abandoned farms out of the bridge to nowhere, the most remote restaurant in the world. And uh, really, really showcasing fine agricultural produce and, and, and uh, uh, you know, uh, stuff out of the bush and, and native mushrooms and all sorts of cool stuff, but just really showcasing and adding value to what we do, and that's what we're trying to do out there. So um, pretty exciting, and that thing's been open, that new, um, the chef's table at Blue Duck Station has been open about three and a half months. And even with COVID, we always wanted to be 50% New Zealand guests. So obviously, we're 100% New Zealand guests at the moment, and um, I can't even book a table there. Unreal, unreal. So pretty cool to be opening that amongst COVID and New Zealanders are just saying, hell yes, we want to go there and we want to experience this and we want to taste this. And it's a, it's, a, it's a pretty cool journey right at the moment. Heaps of challenges, as soon as it rains, you know, it takes hours to get up there and get the gear up there and everything like that. But people are looking for cool experiences, eh? And that's what we're trying to offer. So hey, um, I've got a real brief summary. I'll try and wrap it up in about three minutes here, but um, I thought I had to give you some take home messages and I came up with too many of them. But a couple of minutes and then uh, Sarah's going to kick me off and, and um, you're going to get on with your Monday nights and get home. But uh, number one, keep New Zealand beautiful. How lucky are we? From the mountains to the sea, we've got all the resources we need here and COVID has just shown how lucky we are in New Zealand. Fred Dagg said it best a long time ago, but we live in the best place in the world, don't ever forget it. Number two, rural New Zealand place is the best place of the best place in the world. You know, uh, you know, rural, we're not dealing with the traffic and the gangs and the motels and the 501s and Cindy putting everyone up in the motels that haven't got a house and, you know, we've got the best place in the world, but our communities are struggling. The government is seemingly pushing the small guy out. Corporatisation is coming in. We've got to unite, push back against that, you know. Build our rural communities or we will lose them. We will end up with pine trees all over the place and our kids living in the cities. Who wants that? Number three. Life is a balance. Veganism is not natural. <laughs> Neither is factory farming. Get away from both of these things, New Zealand. We were evolved as hunter-gatherers, and uh, you know it's all about balance, and bring balance back to the farmlands as well. On your farms, in your lives, balance, balance, balance. Just remember, you just have to be a left-leaning, right-wing, redneck, greenie. Number four, be resilient and stick together. We will not grow great children by wrapping five-year-olds in bubble wrap and not allowing them to climb trees, nor will we grow great businesses with wrapping it up in bureaucracy and just annoying the hell out of everyone so they don't want to be in business. Number five, embrace, embrace the change. Have a business that you love and that you want to pass on to your children with so much passion or change it. Always evolve and instill values into your children and have them marry locally. But not too low, we've got to manage that. We don't want inbreeding. We don't want any inbreeding, all right? Because that used to happen down the valley. And no good, no good. <laughs> Number six, be good to Mother Earth. She provides everything we need. Leapfrog the expectations of our urban cousins on what they think we should manage this place like. Show how much you care. Rural wide New wild New Zealand, this is your home. Tell your stories, change the narrative. Look after rural New Zealand. Number seven. Add value. Be a price maker, not a price taker. Farmers have traditionally been price takers. You take what you're given and you're always at the bottom of the food chain. $40 billion worth of agricultural exports turns into $400 billion worth of end produce. Massive opportunity there. They can't turn that into $400 billion without your $40 billion worth of produce. Add value. We're selling logs to China at the moment. We have got a timber shortage in New Zealand. We're selling logs to China and we're buying finished timber products from China back into New Zealand. This makes bugger all sense to a simple economist like me. Add value to what you're doing. No cheap commodities out of New Zealand in the future. We are very lucky to be here. You are 500 times more likely to have been born in China or India than you were to be born in New Zealand. You know that? You know, and we've got this thing, um, so just add value. Number eight. New Zealand doesn't need to feed the world, but we do need to lead the world. As I said, there's no shortage of food in the world, but we've got a great ecology down here, and we've got to prove that you can have a great ecology and a great economy. We want to lead the world on health and well-being. We want to be the biggest conservation project on the planet and produce really, really cool products. Show leadership. Become the world's green light. 
Number nine, the world is not fair. Equality will never be here. Never was since there was more than two people on the planet. Be yourself. Don't be normal. Normal's boring. Be yourself. Love many. Trust few. Always paddle your own canoe. And number 10, after all that, don't take life too seriously. None of us are going to get out of it alive. We're just navigating our way through this beautiful, challenging life. Half it's luck, half it's good management, half it's something else. I never really was very good at maths. Um, but, you know, just remember, along the way, have as much fun as you can. Thank you very much. No worries. No worries at all. Do you need that or not? No. Okay. You know. Hey, I will wrap up really quickly. Understand it's a 9:30 on a school night, let alone a Monday night. Uh, and just as a little passing comment on the post-it notes, uh, just a word from Sandra. If it's an action point, but also to if it's just a take-home key message, that would be greatly appreciated. Uh, and as a little bit of a teaser, if you write your name at the bottom of your post-it note, you'll go on the draw to win a subscription to Shepidius Magazine. So, of course, now I can see we're grabbing the post-it notes. So, uh, you did a very, very good job there, Christy, of selling the Shepidius story. Just a um, huge thank you to our three speakers, particularly for the two that are actually, sorry, three that have travelled from the North Island. Um, that's absolutely incredible. Thank you so much for coming all of this way uh, to be able to, you know, get us to think differently uh, around how we see through different lenses the world uh, and from your different perspectives so that we can see the, the world in different places because um, it really, it does really seriously comes down to, you know, you having change happen to you or you being that change maker. That's one choice that you actually have. Which one will you choose? Thank you so, so much for coming tonight. Thank you to Thriving Southland, to the Invercargill Working Men's Club, and the great team here uh, for having myself come down as, and, and have the guests in as well as yourself. So take care driving home and uh, yeah, get those wee thinking caps on, but please obviously have a good sleep first before you put that into action. You've been an awesome audience. Thank you so much.